Okay, today's daf is daf Shabbat Kafhe. We are, uh, today's daf is dedicated to Eloi Nishmat Moshe Ben Bitzalel and Sprint Sepesel by his daughter Rachel Levy and by Matt Nelson in honor of Liz Kirshner's birthday. Happy birthday. Okay, we're starting at the very top. Um, just to review, we started yesterday the new Mishnah and we were talking about Ema the Kimbit Shem and Sreifa Biyomto. And then we said, What's the reason? Because you can't burn sanctified items on Yom Tov, which then we said, where do we get that from? And we brought four different reasons, if you remember, the one can't burn sanctified items on Yom Tov, right? That was what Shem and Shreifa is. It's things that need to be burned. And then we saw four reasons. We had Loto Tiru. I put it on the top of the, today's sheet just so that you can review. Lotu Tiru Mimenu Aboker, the extra Aboker meant they didn't burn it, the notar, what was left over from the korban that wasn't eaten of the korban Pesach, until the following morning. Um, and that's because it wasn't not the morning after Pesach, but the, mor the morning after the korban, but the morning after that, because it can't be burned on Yom Tov. We had Olat Shabbat B'Shabbat one can only burn the things that are relevant for that day. Um, the Ochal Nefesh Pasuk, what's allowed to be done in Yom Tov, we said Livado includes Lomila Shalobizmana, and then from Kapachomer we can learn also to Kodshim. Since Kodshim has no time frame of when one is supposed to burn, Kodshim would get disqualified. Therefore, that was the third. And the fourth was Shabbaton, which meant it's an Ase and a Lota Ase, and you can have a Mitzvah Ase of burning Kodshim, which overrides the Ase of Shabbaton, you need to rest and the low tasse of one can't do malacha. Okay, that's where we ended yesterday. Now we're gonna pick up on an assumption that was made from this whole thing, which is that, what was this all coming to teach you? Well, you can't burn the, the kachim on Yom Tov. So what does that seem to imply otherwise though? The Yom Tov Huda Asir Ha Bechol Shapir Dami. But that means, now, okay, I should have said that more specifically. You can't burn the kudshim on Yom Tov and benefit from them for your Shabbat candles. Okay? But it means that you can benefit from them otherwise. If you burnt them on a regular day, it means that you can benefit. Now, one would think if they're kudshim that are disqualified and one has to burn them, then you would think that that means that they have to be burnt and you can't benefit. But this seems to imply that you can actually benefit as long as it's not being done in Yantif, which is a separate problem, but you can actually benefit. So now they want to know, where did they get that from? My time, what's the reason that you can actually benefit from truma that got, burnt, that got um, impure, that you're now burning, right? You would think that the whole reason you have to burn it is because you can't benefit from it. And now we're learning that when you burn it, you can actually use the, the stuff that you're burning, right? You can cook with it, you can use it for light. So where do we get this from? So Amarav, Kishem Shemitzvah Lisrof HaTakodeshim Shemitzmau, Okay, just like it's a mitzvah to burn sacrificial meat or anything that was sanctified that got um, impure. Likewise, it's a mitzvah to burn truma that became impure. Okay, so far that didn't say anything. But here he adds, The Torah said, While you're burning it, benefit from it. Okay, now I don't know if you're full, you're know the whole Torah by heart and, and know that, you know, probably this doesn't ring a bell, okay? Where, where do we have a Pasuk that says, oh, by the way, go benefit from truma that you're burning, okay? It doesn't exactly say it in the Torah. So the Gemara asks, heichanam la Torah. In other words, Rav said, basically, you need to burn truma and you can, the Torah said you can benefit from it. So where did the Torah say this? So the Gemara is going to ask. So we're now going to have three reasons. It's going to take us a while until we get to the third. That's why I'm giving you the structure now, so we remember when we get there. There's going to be three reasons. The first is midi rav nachman. Da'am rav nachman amar rav rav amal kha. The pasuk says, okay, here's our first verse we're going to learn it from. Again, this is charted out on the sheet to make it easier. Va'ani hine natati l'chad mishmeret chumotai. If this is a pasuk, it says, Hashem says to Aharon, it's bamidbar yud chet pasuk chet. And he says, I have given you for your protection, or, or not for your protection, I've given you the mishmeret, the protected trumotai, the trumot that I gave you. So now trumotai in Hebrew, that, that reads as your plural trumot, okay? Not one truma, but two trumot, trumotai, okay? My trumotai I've given you. So what are trumot plural? Bishte trumot ha-katum ha-gabel. Achat trumot ha 
the Torah, Hashem is saying to Aaron, I'm giving you two trumah. I'm giving you tahor, pure trumah, and I'm also giving you impure trumah. Vamrachmana. Now, how do we know that this is given then to benefit? Because it says, natati lecha. This is given to you for your use. This is kind of like shlach lecha. Remember the famous about the maraglim that God said, fine, you want to send it, it's going to be your sending, not my sending, right? That the Jews asked if they wanted to send maraglim, Hashem didn't want them, but he said, fine, it's on your, or lech lecha for Abraham, right? This is for you. So likewise, this is for you that you're allowed to use it. Okay, so there you have one pasuk, well, that's the first proof. Trumotai, that God is saying, you can use it. That's where God says, benefit from, burn, from truma that you're burning. Another option is from Rabbi Yavau. Okay, first you have to know what this pasuk is and where the, what the context is. This is what we call bi'or ma'asrot. Okay, again, we have this seven-year cycle. We talked about this before. The first and the second year, you're, okay, let's talk even back. You take truma for the Kohanim from that. You take your, um, right, in all the six years, other than the seventh year, which is a Shemitah year, you take truma, you give Maser a tenth, and after you take your truma, you take a tenth and you give to the Levi. Then we have, um, then we have Maser Sheni, which is in years number one and two and four and five. We give, we bring it to Jerusalem, or we redeem it on the coin and bring the coin to Jerusalem and eat it in Jerusalem, years number three and six, it's Maser, I need we give it to the poor. At the end of the third year, because we, they're kind of viewed as these two three-year cycles, at the end of each three years, because it ends with Maser Ani, we're supposed to do, or kind of, it's actually not the end of the year, but it's after the third year, after the sixth year, we're supposed to take any, we have to make sure that we've kind of taken all the Maser and everything we have, and in addition, what that means nowadays, for example, we do this, and if we, what we do when we take Master Shani nowadays is we redeem it onto a coin. And that coin has to be destroyed. Um, it's actually done right around now on Pesach of the fourth year and the seventh year. This year is not one of those years, but it would be done right around now. And then you have to say a declaration, which is, I destroyed all the Master that I have. I've given everything I'm supposed to have, anything that you know, wasn't taken care of. I've gotten rid of my house. And then it says, which means I didn't enjoy from the masra when I burnt them. Okay, so that seems to imply one cannot benefit from burnt masra. What does that have to do with our truma? Well, Mimenu means from it, meaning, Mimenu is always taught as, or may, or, right, it's from, which means there's something else that is, meaning just this, not something else. So this seems to imply you can't benefit from Maser that gets disqualified, but you can from Truma, okay? That's their assumption. So now the obvious question becomes, why was Truma the thing that became the item that one does benefit from? Maybe it could have been something else. So before, if you remember, I told you we're gonna have three reasons. I just wanna keep reminding you of the structure. Three sources for where it says in the Torah you can benefit from truma. The first was the trumotai. The second is lo mi menu betame, which means just from it, but not from truma. So this is an implied from the pasuk. Um, and then we're going to get to a third. But before we get to the third, we're going to have questions on this. So now they're going to ask and say like this. There's a lot of questions one can ask, and we're going to ask them all. So ema mi menu atamavir shemen shel kodesh shenitma. Why specifically truma? Maybe it could have been sacrificial items or, or anything that was sanctified to the temple, right? There's things sanctified to the temple and there's things that the Kohen gets. Those are two different categories. Why wouldn't you have said, maybe it comes to exclude Shemin of Kodesh that became impure? So they say, well, obviously not Kodesh because if you remember, by the way, on our chart of, of, uh, of Tuma, right? There's Rishon, Shani, right? There's Av, whatever, Aviavot, Av, Rishon, Cheni, Shlishi, Ravii. If you remember, we said that there's Shlishi goes for Truma, not for, not for uh, regular items, not for cooling, and for Truma and Kodshim, and Ravii is only for Kodshim, right? You see that Ravii is a higher status of Kedusha. So therefore, it's obvious, not Kodshim, and they're going to say, although they're going to answer it a little bit differently than I said, which is, 
Lav kavachomeru? Isn't this a kavachomer? Ma maaser hakal amra Torah lo biarti mimenu betame kodesh chamor lo kol shaken? Now, maaser in general is, is more lenient than truma. It's more lenient than kodshi. It's, maaser is, we, everyone gets to eat it, right? Truma is just for the kohanim. Kodesh, right? Anything that's kodesh has to be eaten in a particular place and by particular people. Sometimes, sometimes all of us can eat, right? If you, like, for example, Koran Pesach is kodesh and everybody ate it. It's not like it's only for kohanim, but certain sacrificial meats were only for kohanim and certain things had to be eaten within a certain time frame and within a certain place. So there's all these laws about kodshim. So kodshim is much more strict than Maser Shemi, which only had to be eaten in Jerusalem and could be anything. And you, it's your fruits and you bring it and everybody eats it. It's, it's not, it doesn't really have sanctity to it. So therefore, if Maser that doesn't really have the same level of sanctity to it can be burned, then all, I'm sorry, can't be benefit, you can't benefit from it when you burn it, then all the more so we're going to say kodesh. And that's why we said, ah, truma, Yes, you can benefit, but not Kodesh. But the obvious question is, But if Maser, right, if we go along the scale, and we have Maser, then we have Trum is more strict, then we have Kodesh is even more strict, then if it says you can't benefit from burned Maser, theoretically, you can't benefit from burned Truma or from burned Kodesh. So therefore, they question and they say, that doesn't make any sense. So then they say, no, well, Haktiv Mimenu. We're stuck with the fact that it says mimenu. Mimenu means this, no, but something else, yes. So if we're going to pick something, we're going to pick truma. So now they say umala'ita. Now, I kind of set this up already that the level is truma than kodesh. But the Gemara is going to a little bit question and say, maybe not. Again, right, they like to throw everything up in the air. And they say, right, mistabra kodesh lomimata It seems to make sense that it wouldn't be kodesh that would be the thing that became the at the uh, exception to the rule here, where we'd be more lenient. Why? Shekem Siman, I like to call this pancakes, okay? Panagachas, okay? It sounds, if you want to remember it, it sounds like pancakes if you put it together. But what's the, what's the root? So what's the um, Siman? It's to remember six ways in which Kodesh is more Hamur. So it's, I'll read it carefully and not just saying, saying pancakes, but it's Panagachas, okay? So what is Panagachas? It's six things that are true about Kodesh. Okay, this is good because we're going to start to get into terminology that's going to come up all the time. The more we go over it, the more you'll remember it. Okay, Pigel. Pigel is a case where you have um, the Kohen, uh, or actually could be a regular person, um, while someone is either slaughtering the animal for the, cor for the sacrifice or while they're sprinkling the blood, they have in their mind, okay, this is very important. This is the beginning of Zvach, and when we start off, we're going to get to this first Mishnah, which the first thing they tell you about sacrifices is your intent is what's important. So if you have a thought in your mind while you're, let's say, slaughtering, that I'm going to sprinkle the blood or I'm going to eat the korban outside the place or outside the time frame, which is allowed for that mitzvah, okay, for example, the zrika has to be done that day, can't be done the next day. The eating, it depends. There's different laws about different sacrifices, how long one has to eat. But either which way, there's a time frame. And what this person does is he has in mind, while I'm doing this act of either slaughtering or while I'm sprinkling the blood, has in mind that the act of either sprinkling or, right, obviously if you're doing the sprinkling act, it would be the thought of eating it, would be done chutzlim komo or chutzlis mano, outside of the place or outside of the, of the, um, of the time frame. And then, if it's chutz kamo, then it's just asur. If it's chutz lizmano, outside the time frame, then um, if you then go ahead, so first of all, that disqualifies your korban entirely. And then if you go ahead and eat the meat, then you're chayav karet, okay, which is the most severe, right? You get cut off by God in some way. So now, that's pigol. So number one, that has the chumrah of pigol, how important the machshav is, that's one thing. Notar. Notar is what we just talked about, that the meat that's left over beyond the time that one is allowed to has to be burned. And again, if one eats it, one gets correct. Korban. Okay, it has to do with, right, korbanot, sacrifices, they're to God. Mi'ila. Mi'ila means that one, by the way, the Rashi Tevot are getting a little tricky here, right? Pana is very easy. Pigul, notar, korban. But now, Achas, okay, starts with an ayin, so it doesn't start with a mem, I'm not sure why, 
but Mi'ila has an ayin as its second letter. Sometimes they do this in the world of abbreviations. So the ayin is Mi'ila, Kaf is Karet, and the Samach is even more tricky, Asur Le'onein. Okay, that's already like really not so connected. But anyway, that's how they did their Rashi Tevot in those days. So now let's go through the last three. Me'ila is if, Me'ila is misuse of consecrated property. So if I take something that was designated for the temple and I use it for my own purposes, I have to bring a korban mi'ila, it's called, okay, an asham mi'ila, it's a korban asham, um, a guilt offering. And I also have to return the value of what I took, what I used, plus an additional homage. So that's mi'ila, again, which all this doesn't apply to truma. This is only for kodesh. The karet, okay, you get karet. Rashi says on what, because there's a few things you get karet for, also the people in Notar. But Rashi says they're talking about if it became tame and you ate it, then you would get karet for it. And a sorla onen. Okay, this is an onen is someone who, um, some, one of their close relatives died and they haven't yet buried the person. While you're in that time period, you're not allowed to eat any sacrificial meat. So again, you see here all these things, these six reasons would say this makes Kodesh severe, right? Stringent. That's why, where are we? Well, we started with maser. Maser, one can't eat if it becomes impure. Um, one can't, sorry, benefit from, let's say, oil that's burned from there. Likewise, we're going to say that applies to Kodesh because Kodesh is so severe, but trum is not as severe and therefore not as stringent. Therefore, we're, we're going to say trum is the exception to the rule. As again, we have to find some exception. It's got, and we're going to say it's trum. But now the Gemara says, Adraba, Truma Lome Ma'idna, Shekane Machpaz, but Truma's got its own Chubro to it that don't exist by code. Okay, what's Machpaz Siman, right? That's the Siman for this. So, Mita, this is a little easier. Mita, Chomesh, En La Pidyon, and Asura Lizarim. Okay, so there the Zion is Zarim, Pe is Pidyon, right? The Mem is Mita and Chomesh. So let's go through. Mita, you get Mita Bide Shamayim if you are, for example, you're a um, a non kohen eats truma, you get death by God, okay, by the hands of God. Or if you're a kohen who ate truma that became impure, which you're not allowed to do, also you would get mita. So it has mita. It has chomesh, which means if you ate, if you're a non kohen and you ate someone else, you ate truma, you'd have to return to the kohen truma, the value of the truma, plus an additional fifth, okay, which again is a quarter, but we'll get to that. It can't be redeemed. Like Master Shani, for example, you can redeem. Even if you, if you sanctify, well, it depends on what it is, but certain things can be redeemed. When it comes to sanctified items, certain things can't, but truma can never be redeemed. Okay? It always has saying, right? redeeming always means if I take a coin and I say this is in place of that, then the, the, let's say I have food, so that food is no longer sanctified and the sanctity moves to the coin. That's exactly what we do in Master Shani. We move the sanctity to something else. So this has no pidyon truma, and it's forbidden to anybody other than a coin, whereas sacrificial meat, like we just said, could be eaten by other people, right? There could be situations like any korban shlamim is eaten by the owner, and it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be a coin. So what do you see? Four full growth that are by truma, which make, makes that very significant. So therefore, why would we say this and not that? Well, hanach nefishin, ah, Notice we had six, okay, it's easy to remember because of the Rashi Tevot. We had six when it came to Kodesh, and we only have four when it came to Truma. So if you talk about quantity, well, there's more Chum wrote about Kodesh than about Truma. So again, we're going to say that's why we're allowed to eat the Truma, or benefit, not eat, um, sorry, to enjoy the light, let's say, from the oil of Truma while it's burning. V by Dema, second answer, Kodesh Chamur Shekena Nush Kavet. Kodesh is more severe because you get kare. In other words, if you put kare versus mitabi de shamayim, now they're both death by the hands of God, but kare is a much more severe one. Again, we, know, we don't exactly know what kare is, um, but it's definitely got, it's considered more severe. So therefore, if you, it's right, this is quantity or quality, okay? It's basically going to be a more severe um, onesh, and therefore it must be more severe. And therefore, again, that's where we see in the Torah back to, below be r to me menu that you can't burn that but you can bring something else which are we going to pick we're going to pick true okay now we're back to our third answer okay third answer to the question where do we get it in the Torah? Rav Nachman bar Yitzchak Amar Amar Ka the Pesach says Titen Lo okay this is 
about the Pasuk about giving the Truma to the Kohen, Reshit Gamchati Roshchav Yitzarecha, the Reshit Gez Sonchati Tein Lo. These are things that go to the Kohen. So what did they learn here? Lo Velo La Oho, which means they say, you have to give it to him, and the idea is you give it to him to use, meaning to eat, okay? Things that, they, that he can eat, meaning when you give Truma, if you, let's say, have Truma in your possession, let's say you're not a Kohen and you're about to give to the Kohen, and it becomes tame. So you shouldn't be giving that to a Kohen because then you're kind of giving him something that he can't use to eat. So now they say, lo velo la ovo. In other words, give him something he can use to eat and not something just that he can use for light. Now what's implied in that? Well, he can use it for light, just that's not what you're supposed to give him because it doesn't really benefit him so much. So Michlal, from here one can infer, debat orohu, that he actually can use it for the light. It's just that we're commanded not to give that to him because it's, that's not what he wants to receive, right? He really wants to get food because the coin needed food because the coin didn't have property. Okay. Um, it just made me think about, we've been talking a lot the last while about growing our garden and having our own vegetables to eat, right? So that we don't have to go to the store to buy stuff. So I was thinking, right, in the context of this, that's how we can understand how the coin felt, right? He didn't have his own land. He couldn't grow his own stuff. He was dependent totally on, right? We don't ever feel dependent for food because we can go to the store, we can, right, we're free to roam about. But now with, with this virus going around, we, we really, we can sort of understand what it's like to not be able to have food so easily accessible and to have this, right? So the Kohen had no way to access his food other than getting these gifts. So if you give it to him and it's already disqualified and he can only use it for burning, that's not so useful even though it is useful for something, but not so useful otherwise. But again, one can imply from there that he could use it for the light, and therefore we have our three answers. Okay, moving back now to the mission. Next line in the mission is, Rabbi Yishmael Omer, Ema de Kim Itran Mipnei Kvod HaShabbat. So, my time, well, what's the reason? Amar Rabba, Mitoch Sherecho Rab. Remember, this is the tar. Tar is a very bad smell. And what's the concern then? We're worried that you're going to light the candles and then leave the room because the smell is so bad. So Amalei Abaye, Abaye says to Rabbi, Vietze, uh, so what? Okay, at least you lit your candles, you did your mitzvah, you lit your candles. What do we care if you walk out of the room? And here we get to the real idea behind lighting candles, which we talked about when we first started the parak, but we'll get back to it. so Rabbi says to him, Shani Omer, because I say, I say that it's chova. Now, what exactly? First of all, we know it's chova. What do you mean it's chova? So Tosfot says, it's chova perush bimkom siuda. De chova she is o bimkom aner mishum onik shabbat. Yes, of course, we know you have to light candles, but the question is, what is is the obligation of candles that you have your candles lit where you're eating? Okay, so he says, I hold that it's chovan, that the candles be lit in the place where you're eating. That's how Tosfut understands this line about it being chovan. That one has to have candles lit where you're eating, and then he's going to say, Amar Rav Nachman Bar Zabda, Amar Rav Nachman Bar Rava, Amar Rav, Halakat Yer B'Shabbat Chovan, Rechitzat Yadayim V'Raglayim V'Chamin, Arvit Rishut. Okay, now here's a list of things one has to do in preparation for Shabbat. So, and here's where we talked about in the beginning that it could be that halakat ner, certainly originally, was just a way, it was one of those things you have to do, just like we walk around our house checking our lights before Shabbat, right? We say, okay, let's make sure, turned on this bathroom light, turned off my bedroom light, right? All those things, turned on the Shabbos lamps. So likewise, they would have to light the candle as preparation for Shabbat to make sure that they had light where they were eating and in general. So other things they need to do was wash their bodies, right? Wash their hands, feet, in hot water. Okay, so now, it's a little strange. It says arvit. Arvit sounds like at night, but what they mean is erev, okay, in the afternoon. So that is rishut, okay? There's certain preparations that are obligatory and certain that are not obligatory. So washing before Shabbat, it's important, but it's, it's, an, it's option. But ha- making sure there's a candle, lighting a candle before Shabbat, that's chova. Okay, so then he says, and then, by the way, Rav Nachman says, ani omer mitzvah. I actually say that Rechitzat Edan V'Raglayim is a mitzvah. We see now three terms here. There's Rashut, Chova, and Mitzvah. Now, you would have thought Halakat Nir Shabbat is a mitzvah, right? We always talk about it as a mitzvah. And this might be a source where it seems to indicate 
that it's just something that needs to be there and not necessarily it's a mitzvah to light candles. Okay, others don't understand it that way. And in fact, there's a really interesting toast book, Dibor Matil Chova, where he says, he, what Tosa tries to do is say, where else do we see this term chova? And the other place it's mentioned, I mean, there's a bunch of places, but he quotes in Maya Machronim. And Maya Machronim, it says is chova. And the reason Maya Machronim, right, it's interesting, a lot of us don't do Maya Machronim. And why is that? So first of all, they say the reason Maya Machronim is chova is because of the melech stomit, the salt in their food that they were worried they were going to touch their eyes and it would blind them. So they wanted to make sure everybody washed their hands after the meal. Now, Mayim Rishonim, before the meal, we always make a, a bracha. Mayim Achronim, nobody thinks we make a bracha. And Tosfot says that there's people who wanted to say, Yeshav Rotsim Lomarim in the sixth line of Tosfot, De'ein lebarecha hadlakat ne'el, midakari lechova. The one actually should make a bracha on lighting candles. Very interesting, right? People said, because it says it's chova, that means we don't have to light candles. We, uh, we don't have to make a bracha on lighting candles, just like, it says, Mayim Achronim is chova. Ve'ein tu'unim bracha. Okay, and therefore no bracha. Ve'omer Rabbeinu Tam, dishi bushu. Rabbeinu Tam says it's a total mistake. And he basically says the chova there does not mean the same thing as the chova here. And this is a good uh, example of when we sometimes try to take example and say, oh, it uses this word. Let's say it means the exact same thing. But sometimes things don't necessarily mean the same thing. And the chova here is not necessarily the same as the chova there. Um, and he says, What's the chovav hadlakat near? And it goes with the previous toast vote where he said the idea here is when we mean chovav, we mean chovav to have light where you're eating, right? That that's specifically where you're supposed to light. And he says, it's hadlakat near, hi chovav shal mitzvah oneg shabbat. Okay, it's part of a mitzvah, uh, it's a chovav, it's one of your obligations of oneg shabbat is to have the candles lit where you're eating and where you're going to be hanging out. So, which again, nowadays is a little bit different because we have light in our house, so it's a little bit less of an obligation, but to have it where you're eating, because anyway, right, but many people are careful to make sure their candles at least can be seen from their dining room table, okay? Not necessarily, um, they have to be on the table or right next to the table, but those are different opinions that come out of this. Um, if you're interested in further um, issues about candle lighting in general, so the, the weekly vlog of Daf Mishalanu of Hamutal and Shira is up on our site already, and they talk specifically about this source, this line, Chova, and they talk about a bunch of other things, why we light two candles, um, different, why specifically the woman does the candles, so I recommend it's a short 10-minute video. Um, okay, in Hebrew. Um, so now, Going back to the Gemara, um, we're now on, so what we saw was, okay, just to review, we saw that this all started because you're not allowed to use the char, and why can't you use the char? Because it has a bad smell. If it has a bad smell, you're gonna leave the room, which Abai didn't really get what the issue was. Came Rava and he said, no, 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 the issue is, it's a chobah to have your candles where you're eating, and therefore, if you're gonna leave the room and not wanna be with it, well then, right, it's gonna ruin your own Shabbat, or, Likewise, you could say if you're going to be in a place where the smell is really bad, um, then also. I was thinking of one Friday night where we had a power failure and we had guests coming and, and there was no, you know, there was no light at all. And thank God we have the Hanukkah candle, the Shabbat, Shabbat candles, because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to see anything, right? And it, it really, it was great because then, you know, luckily I think we'd had the power failure, it was going into Shabbat. So we knew that we were gonna have it. We made sure the candles were right on the table and we ate by candlelight. And then you could really understand how they ate in those days. Not that I recommend getting a power failure right before Shabbat, but, um, but it was, again, these are good ways that we can have our eye into, it's always a matter of trying to put your eyes into their, um, understand what's, what their situation was. So now they wanna know, okay, now we're getting off on a tangent. We talked about washing hands before Shabbat and how it's reshut. Okay, we're about 10 lines from the top. And then Rav Nachman said, but I say it's a mitzvah. So now the Gemara says, my mitzvah, like where do you see that's a mitzvah to do this? So he doesn't really prove it from the Torah or anything like that, but he takes an example from a rabbi. The Amar Rav Yehuda Amarav, as Rav Yehuda said in the name of Rav, kach hayam in agosha Rav Yehuda bar Eli. Okay, he takes precedent from something someone else did. This is what Rav Yehuda bar Eli would do at Erev Shabbat. Okay, on Erev Shabbat, this is what he would do. They would bring him a, a, a what's the word, a, some sort of utensil full of hot water. 
ורוחץ פניו, ידיו ורגליו, he will wash his face, his hands and his legs, או his feet, ומתעתק ויושב בסטינים המצויצים, and then he would lie in a cloak with ציצית on it, ודומה למלאך השם צבאות, אוקיי? And he would be lying there, right? Imagine, like, you get out of the shower and you lie down, you're in this, like, total relaxation, okay? He looked like an angel of God. והיו תלמידיו מכבים ממנו קמפק סוטניה, we're really off on a tangent, his students would hide the corners of their clothing, okay? Because they didn't have tzitzit on the corners of their clothing, and we're going to see, did they not exactly have tzitzit? What exactly? It's a big debate. Amar lehen, now somehow he noticed, because people like that notice everything. Amar lehen banai, lo kach shiniti lachem, sadim b'tzitzit, b'et shamay potrin, u'bet hilel mechaibim. Didn't I teach you that a sadim b'tzitzit, what are you supposed to do? B'et shamay says you're putter. And Beit Hillel says you're chayav. What exactly are we talking about? Well, the issue is that your sadin is made of flax, and the tzitziot were made of wool. And the psukim about shatnes, that you can't mix flax, linen, and wool, are, um, are mentioned right next, right next to the psukim about tzitzit. And because they, they darshan the smichu parashiyot, it says, lo tovah shatnes, and then it says, g'dilim ta'aselcha. And they darsh it from there, this comes up in Menachot, that one is allowed to make tzitzit out of a combination of linen and wool. Even though shantanis is generally not permitted, it's permitted for the mitzvah of tzitzit. The mitzvah of tzitzit overrides the isur of shantanis. Right? We just saw before that you can't have an ase doche, ase velotase, but here it's doche, alotase of shantanis. So now, so that you can have. So there's a whole di- discussion there we'll get to in Menachot about how they learn this out. In any case, he says, now, what's the issue? So the issue is, there's two ways to read this. Either that the tzitzit were shatnes, right? The, there was wool and the, and the linen, and they, and, and they basically said, we're not putting the wool on our linen garments. And then he said, what are you talking about? Beit Shammai says no, but Beit Hillel, putlin means you're putter from tzitzit on that cloth, because if you put, if you have a wool bag, then you put tzitzit. But if you have a linen bag, then you can't, because the tzitzit are wool. And therefore, they didn't, right, they didn't, uh, Beit Shammai says you don't have to, Beit Hillel says you're chayav, and then he continues to say, Valachah, can you write Hillel? Can you write Beit Hillel? And we pass him like Beit Hillel, so why aren't you doing this? Now, what were they doing? So again, the question is what exactly they were doing. Was it just linen, and they said, we're not putting in at all? Or was it that they put, they put linen strings, okay, but not wool strings. Now, why wool strings specifically? Because trelet, is wool, right? That's what trelet is. It's blue, it's dyed wool. So maybe they were wearing tzitzit, but they weren't putting the trelet in it, okay? So he was upset that they weren't wearing trelet in their tzitzit, and, and they were saying, oh no, we can't put the trelet in, but we do use wool tzitzit. And that's what the mafreshim do, who can't imagine that they weren't actually wearing tzitzit, right? How could that be? So, but others say, no, they actually weren't wearing tzitzit at all. They had an issue with tzitzit and with putting the wool strings in, and therefore they didn't have any strings. So there's a big debate, in other words, and it wasn't that they didn't use tzitzit, it's just they didn't use tzitzit on their linen clothing. They used on other clothing, if it was made of wool, then they would have tzitzit, but not on them. So again, the issue, was it just trelet, or was it tzitzit in general? In any case, they said, now what inu sabre, so what were they thinking, even though they know that Beit Hillel was mechaibim, so why did they say, we're not going to do it anyway? What do they say? They were clothes that people wore in the day and clothes that people wore at night, right? We simply call those pajamas. And the issue is if they have pajamas that also, you know, once they're going to allow shatnes in their clothing and allow you to put tzitzit on the clothes during the, that you're wearing during the day, they were worried that people would put tzitzit also on their nighttime clothing. Now, what's the problem with putting tzitzit on your nighttime clothing? Well, the problem is that you're not having tzitzit at night. If you're not chayav and tzitzit at night, then you're not allowed to do this shatnes. And if you can't do the shatnes, well, then you're ending up, people are making the gadim of shatnes and they're wearing the gadim of shatnes, which is really usr. It's only mutar to do during the day when you're wearing, right? Or you could even have it on, a, on a, an item of clothing that you're wearing at nighttime, as long as it's an item of clothing that you're supposed to wear during the day. But if it's an item designated specifically like pajamas just for night, other than maybe nowadays the people wearing their pajamas during the day, but I don't know about that. But theoretically, if it's just meant for night, then people wouldn't wear them during the day. And therefore, basically, you would end up 
that people would be doing shotness. And for that reason, they were worried that people would end up doing that. And that's why they said, don't, don't do this at all, okay? Um, next slide. So now we got off on this washing our bodies and Onik Shabbat. Now we're gonna get a little off on a tangent. But tis nach mishalom nafshi. Now we're gonna take a pasuk from Echa, okay, where it says, but tis nach mishalom nafshi nashi titova. What does this mean? After the destruction, I left my peaceful abode, okay, like my great things I had, and nashi titova, and I forgot now all the good that, you know, I used to have, all the plenty. So, but tis nach mishalom nafshi, what does that mean? My but tis nach mishalom nafshi, ama rabbi avau, zohat lakat near b'shabbat. Okay, that's this special thing that he says, you know, we had to leave behind. So it's just interesting that they, you know, as they went to Galut, I guess they didn't have oil or something and they couldn't light Shabbos candles. And that's kind of the thing that's Mishalom um, Nafshi. Someone sent me an email yesterday and said, you know, you can do an exercise with Batiznach Mishalom Nafshi. And what are the things that people feel they, they don't have now while we're all homebound and, you know, that they remember that we used to have and what are those things? Um, so you can try it. Anyway. Um, I'm a So now what's, but Nashiti Tova, what is all the good <clears throat> that I, um, that I, that I'm forgetting that we even had, you know, I don't even remember when we had all such good. I'm a Rabbi Yirmiya, Zo Beit HaMerchatz. Okay. This is the Beit HaMerchatz. So now we're talking about the things that people, these are theoretically things that people did before Shabbat, right? They went to the Beit HaMerchatz, they lit their candles. Um, Rabbi Yochanan Amar, there's two different versions here, but we'll just go with Rabbi Yochanan Amar. This is what we saw that Rabbi Yehuda Bar Eli did, washing his hands and feet in hot water. This is a nice bed with nice sheets on it, okay, or maybe nice clothing laid out on it. Rabbi Abba Omer, you're going to like the last one, or maybe not. This is a good wife who's you know, dressed up for Tamidei Chachamim, you'll, you'll be happy to know that some of Hashem say, what does that mean? Well, Tamidei Chacham needs a, a smart, intelligent wife, and that's what it means. It means an intelligent woman who can be a match for the Tamidei Chacham. So that was a good way to go with this. Um, that, I'll stick with that direction. Um, so it's having, right, basically it's saying the good life is having a good wife, right? The, finding the right match, right? You could view it in the reverse also if we were written from the perspective of a woman. Um, okay. Tanu Rabbanan. Now that we're on this, Ezehu, Eze Ashir, this sounds just like Perkavo. What does it mean to be wealthy? Kol Sheyeshlo, because once they're talking about wealth and, and things that are good to have, so they're going to now move into wealth. Kol Sheyeshlo Nacha Uroach Be'oshro, Debre Rabbi Meir. He says very nicely, right? If you, you have peace of mind with your wealth, meaning it doesn't cause you problems and worries and all that. And again, it's kind of like saying, you're happy with what you have. Siman Matkas, again, we have another Siman today. Okay, four more opinions about wealth. Rabbi Charfon Omer, Koshiyeshlo, Mea Chamim, Umea Sadok, Umea Avadim, Shogdim Bahem. Okay, someone who has 100 vineyards, 100 fields, and 100 workers that work for him. Okay, two ways of understanding this. First of all, Rabbi Charfon was very wealthy. So it could be he's just describing. You want to know wealth? This is wealth. Now, it seems a little bit exaggerated. Um, in the Steinsaltz, just quoted in the, in the Koran, you can find it, is right, the Koran is all the Steinzel's commentary. His interpretation is, um, is that he was exaggerating and he was saying, you think that's wealth, right? You think, right, and he was saying a totally exaggerated thing to say this really isn't wealth, right? It has nothing to do with how many fields you have, how many, how many vineyards you have, and how many workers you have. Rabbi Akiva Omer, kol sheyesh lo ishan na'a if you have a woman who's a good, right, and she does good deeds, and if you think about it, right, everybody's talking within their own realm. Rabbi Tarfon was wealthy, so he spoke about wealth. Rabbi Akiva had a good wife. Remember, Rachel, she's the one who convinced him to go learn and, and sacrifice for him. So he said, that's what made me who I am. Rabbi Yossi, Omer, very possibly had health issues. And what he said is, right, a bathroom close to your table. Um, Right, what's the issue here? Well, you have to remember, again, it's hard for us to imagine. We have bathrooms everywhere we want, at least for the most part. But um, right, sometimes you get to a place where you know, you're walking, you're out, there's no bathrooms anywhere, and you can understand. But normally we have bathrooms everywhere. For them, there was an outhouse, it was not so close. And you know, while you're eating, sometimes that's when you have to go to the bathroom. Right? There's always the kid in the family that has to go to the bathroom immediately after eating just to get away from doing the dishes. So right, sometimes people really need right after, and therefore that's a real brush. 
Tanya. Okay, last thing for today, we're now going to have a bright up. Adding another thing to the list that one can't light with. Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar Omer, and actually you might say this is the polar opposite of the previous one. Ein malikim b'tzavi. Okay, tzavi is the sap from the balsam tree. Now, if you remember, we always talked about the balsam tree and how it has this beautiful smell and the fruits were amazing and everything's always beautiful about it. So my time, why can't you light with this? Amaraba mipnesha rechonodeh. Because of the smell will carry, and because of that, you'll want more of it, and you might, again, make it burn more so that you end up with a smell, and that will, you'll end up being chive for actually accidentally putting it out. Um, right, this, right, Rashi says, Ah, right, sorry, my mistake. It's not that, because of the smell, there's no Dave, sorry. I didn't read on. We're worried that you might find the oil smell so pleasing, you'll want to take oil from there. And by taking oil, you're basically causing the candle to go out earlier, and you're chayav in the malacha of mecham. Okay, so it's the exact opposite of staying away from the, the, the candles. Here, you're going to actually take from the candles. I'll just go on a little bit further to the next stop, because it continues. Why don't you say, okay, what exactly, this is not 100% clear to me, Rashi says, Nidbak becomes leabayid, umadligat abayid. It becomes flammable somehow. Because it's tar, um, sap and it's very sticky, and sometimes there's spurt, like things will spurt out from the candle and it'll get on your walls and it might become, you know, light on fire. I guess the, the fire will kind of jump out, you know, light on fire somehow. So isn't, isn't that a good reason not to light, right? It seems like a much better reason than the first one. So what is the answer? Chad de od kamer. I meant that and that, okay? Chad de mefnei obviously because it's flammable. The od gzera shami yistapet men. And also because you might use it in the over and So there's both those reasons. And for that reason, we shouldn't use it. Okay, we'll stop here for today. We'll pick up tomorrow. Shabbat nafkafav.